Welcome everybody. My name is Michael Crawford. I'm CEO of the SOAR CRC. I'm talking to you from my home in Newcastle, New South Wales today. We've got a large audience and uh, there's been a lot of interest in this webinar, which is uh, fantastic uh, from across Australia and even internationally. And I know that um, many of you who are tuned in today might not be directly familiar with the SOAR CRC. So just a, a few words about us from at the start. So full name, the Cooperative Research Centre for High Performance Soils, the SOAR CRC. Uh, we were established uh, three years ago with funding from the Australian Government and from our partners. We have 40 participants in total, including eight universities, four state government agencies, a number of industry groups, and importantly, 20 farmer groups or grower groups from across Australia. And our purpose is to undertake soil related research and development that helps give farmers the tools and knowledge they need to better manage their soils and increase and improve their productivity and profitability. So we've got a whole lot of activities going on, uh, partnerships between researchers and farmer groups across Australia. A lot of it's detailed on our website, which we'll, we'll talk about a bit more later. Um, and, and in that, um, in that space, uh, we've, We've got a whole range of research, some of which uh, we're highlighting for our webinars. Today's uh, talk with uh, Mick Rose on herbicide residues in soils is one of those uh, projects we have uh, underway uh, in, in program four of the Soil CRC. I'll introduce Mick in more detail in just a minute. Uh, but firstly, let me just highlight some of our upcoming webinars as well. In two weeks time, we've got a webinar from Mark Morrison on opportunities for activating consumer markets for good soil stewardship. This helps to ask and answer the question, can we reward and incentivize farmers for good soil management in ways beyond improved productivity and profitability? Are consumers willing to pay for products, for food, for produce that potentially can demonstrate that it comes from a well-managed farm? And then two weeks later, we've got a presentation from Dr. Aravin Surapanini and Dr. Balaji Sasadri on the impacts of liquid injection of biosolids on soil, plants, and groundwater. And how we might be able to use biosolids from, from effluent plants, wastewater management treatment, uh, to help improve our, our soil uh, structure, especially in, um, in, in subsoil conditions. Details on both those webinars can be found at our website sourcehousey.com.au or directly on the chat function, which uh, you can look at uh, whilst in previous uh, Zoom presentation. So a couple of uh, housekeeping notes. Um, Mick's about to start speaking. He'll go for uh, 20 to 25 minutes. Then we'll have a, uh, plenty of time for Q&A after that. And undertaking um, Q&A session, We'll ask that you type your questions into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. Type your questions in there as you go, and at the end of the presentation, we'll answer as many questions as we can before the 45 minutes is up. Otherwise, we can follow up uh, with you directly afterwards. Importantly, we are recording this webinar. It will be available later on the SOAR CRC website for attendees to review and or to share with their colleagues who weren't able to make it uh, to this presentation. Um, and so based on that, I think you can also, you go to our website, you'll be able to see our previous webinars that we've hosted and um, also the details about future webinars. So our speaker today, Mick Rose. Dr. Mick Rose is a senior research scientist in the SOARS unit of one of our partners, New South Wales Department of Primary Industries, based at Wollongbar in Northern New South Wales. He's been undertaking research in this area for a number of years, and uh, today he's speaking in particular about a project that's supported through the Soil CRC. So I'll pass to Mick for his presentation on herbicide residues in soil when persistence doesn't pay. Thanks, Michael. Yeah, can you hear are. me okay? Yes, we can hear you. Excellent. I'll just share this screen. Good. I can see that. 
and can you see me as well? Yes. All right, thanks a lot, Michael, and thanks, Catherine, uh, for the opportunity to give this webinar today. Um, I'll be talking about herbicide residues in soil when persistence doesn't pay, and thinking about this title, um, perhaps it, it might have been better to say, when is it that persistence doesn't pay? Um, and as you can see here, I'm actually broadcasting from the lovely Warren Bungles uh, last December, would you believe, um, when it was still quite dry, as you can see. Uh, and it's conditions like that that really uh, enable herbicide residues to persist in soil, sometimes longer than what we want them to persist in soil. And it's under those conditions that we might start to see uh, effects on subsequent crops that, that, that we really don't want occurring. Um, so this talk is actually coming out of a soil CRC project uh, called Developing Knowledge and Tools to Better Manage Herbicide Residues in Soil. Um, and really I'd like to focus on, on that aspect of this project, which is better managing herbicide residues in soil. So I think there's quite a lot of information out there already uh, that farmers and consultants use when managing herbicides uh, in their crop. And really herbicides are an essential tool for the broad acre crop production that we have in, this, in Australia now. Weed control, um, suppression of weeds is something that really is required to, to get uh, optimum yields and, and profits when, when you're cropping over such large areas. So the cost of employing labour um, or alternative methods that, that don't involve herbicides, you know, can really uh, knock around your, your gross margins. So herbicides really are a, a critical component of the current farming systems we have in Australia. Um, and I think 90 to 95% of the time, farmers and consultants do a really top job of managing and juggling the, the considerations that need to go into growing uh, a high yielding crop. But, but really what this project is about is better management. How can we actually improve um, the management of herbicide residues in soil and reduce those instances where we might see uh, damage or injury to crops? So the, so the team's quite a large team. We've got um, collaborators uh, here at New South Wales DPI, we've got collaborators at Murdoch University and Southern Cross University, and we're working in close partnership with three farming groups, uh, Wantba in Western Australia, Birchip Cropping Group uh, in Victoria and Mallee, and EPARF, so the Air Peninsula um, Agricultural Research Foundation, uh, and SARDI there at, at, at Minipa. So what are the issues? As I said, herbicides, you know, overall really are, are are a large benefit to the, uh, to the cropping systems uh, and the opportunity to uh, harvest high yields. But every now and again, we do have these issues where we see damage to plants. Um, so I've, really, I've categorized those into three kind of different issues. So one is where, where you've got uh, problems that, and damage that you can see quite uh, obviously. So, so visual damage uh, either to the top of the crop or, or to the root system. Uh, and for example, here we've got, um, this, this, these photos are actually from a pot trial where we've applied a residual herbicide. So residual herbicides are ones that, that do persist in soil and, and give longer weed control, um, but the conditions under which they break down vary. Uh, and if it's dry uh, and in some soil types, you might get longer persistence than, than what you might intend to. So the key tool that growers and consultants use is the label, the herbicide label. And what you can see here is that for this chemical, a Mazepic, um, conditions which do not favour breakdown of this product um, can affect sub subsequent susceptible crops. And you can see here that um, the label recommends not pl planting chickpeas until four months after the herbicide was applied. And th in this case, it was only three months and you can see some severe root pruning here uh, and damage to the nodules. So, so this crop's really not going to be yielding as much as, as it should, and it's not going to be fixing as much nitrogen as it should either. Um, so that's an occurrence where, where you might see, the farmer or the consultant might see that obviously, think back to what they've done um, and think, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty certain that that was herbicide residue in soil causing that damage. And they can move on and then make decisions about how they might um, try to bring that crop back to health uh, or replant if damage is, is serious. However, there's probably 
probably the, the hardest to deal with, or one of the hardest issues to deal with, is, is when you don't know that you have herbicide residues in soil. You can't quite work out uh, what the damage you're seeing is from. So we've got an example here of a wheat plant that's not quite growing like it should. But the question is, is it aphids? Is it nutrient deficiency? Could it be herbicide carryover? Or have we had some herbicide drift uh, from, from off farm com, come on and damage this plant? And the key issue here is that unless that problem is solved, um, the grower or consultant could spend a lot of money uh, addressing an issue that might not actually be the cause for that damaging plant. So um, it would be great if we had the tools to be able to say, with some certainty that yes, we're pretty certain that that is a herbicide residue carryover. Um, and we can then say, right, what, what can we do to address that? Could we plant a different crop uh, and, and have success, uh, a more tolerant crop to that herbicide residue? And the third type of issue I've categorized as NFI, which you could think of as end fixing issues. So these are issues where we don't even know that we have a problem. So what I've got here is actually some work that was done um, quite some years ago now in South Australia, looking at the effect of in-crop herbicides um, on the growth of field peas. So these herbicides here are herbicides that are actually registered for use um, in field peas that, that knock out weeds in, in a crop of field peas. Um, and when you look at the results at the end of the season, you can see that there's no significant difference when herbicides were applied in crop to the control uh, plant, so the crop looks great. And the grower or the consultant might think, oh, there's plenty of nitrogen going out, back in. You know, we've got our, a good looking rotation crop here. We've got lots of nitrogen being fixed. We're yielding really well. But the interesting thing was that when the researchers uh, did some more investigation into the amount of nitrogen being fixed, what you can see is that there is a significant difference between when herbicides are being used and when they're not being used in terms of the nitrogen being fixed. Uh, by that crop. So another question that, that comes up, are there some of these sublethal effects of herbicide residues that we're not actually seeing or not actually uh, understanding? Uh, and you can see here, I've trawled Twitter, um, that fountain of knowledge, and you can see a lot of discussion about uh, what may or may not be a herbicide residue effect. Here we've got 2,4-D, uh, here a chemical that we're actually focusing on this project called Popir Pyrolid, a lump of the trade name. Um, uh, we've got uh, group B um, herbicides after, after a dry spring um, and, and, and other herbicides as well. So one of the, one of the key issues with this re research is really with over a hundred different herbicide actives registered in Australia, where do we focus our efforts? And so working with the grower groups that we're working with, we've asked them to identify which herbicides, um, their growers and their consultants that they work with uh, are having issues with or, or they think we could generate more knowledge about that we could better manage th those herbicides and potential residue carryover in soil that might damage crop. So in this project we're actually focusing on four different herbicides from with different modes of action. Um, group B herbicide imazimox, uh, group I herbicide clopyrolid, Group C herbicide diuron and group K pyroxysulfone. So this is, these three chemicals have been around for a while. Uh, pyroxysulfone is a relatively new addition to the arsenal, the herbicide arsenal, um, and was registered a few years back now, maybe five, five to six, six years ago. So it's had some use, um, but probably not as much as the others. Now what I've got listed here is what we call the octanol water partition coefficient. Basically that tells us how soluble um, these chemicals are in water and whether they prefer to bind to organic matter or whether they prefer to stay dissolved in water. Uh, so highly negative, the lower the number is, the more water soluble it is. So you can see clopyrolid is, is very water soluble and mobile. Imazimox is intermediate, but still fairly mobile in, in soil water. Um, and diuron and pyroxysulfone less so. So they have more, a greater tendency to actually stick to the soil. So that, that's called salt and onto the soil surface. The other um, parameter that I've got here is the half-life. And you can see these half-lives, we don't we can't really have an average value. There's, there's a range of values and it depends on 
how the study was carried out, what soil types were used, and under what conditions these chemicals were put into the soil. So the half-life is a measure of how long it takes for half of that herbicide that was put in to, to degrade or dissipate. And you can see that, for example, in Mazamox in lab studies, where you've set up a small chamber and you're incubating the chemical within you, in there and you're just looking at degradation, you can see they're quite long half-lives. But in the field, probably because it's more water soluble, the half-life is a lot shorter. That means it's dissipating and being removed from soil a lot quicker. Um, some of that is, is potentially due to, to leaching and water in movement, um, different, different temperature conditions, different moisture conditions. Uh, but you can see they're all relatively persistent in soil. Uh, and in some cases, um, half of the chemical that you applied at the start of the season might be there at the end of the season or even the start of the next cropping season, depending on the conditions. So what do we know about persistence in the soil? Well, after we apply the chemical uh, over time, some of the chemical is transported off site. So it can either be leached or move off in water. Some chemicals are volatile and um, escape into the atmosphere. Uh, but generally, the bulk of the herbicide is usually transformed or degraded um, and usually by soil microorganisms. Although some, some her different herbicides can be chemically de degraded as well. So over time, we'll be left with the total residue uh, amount in soil. However, that's not the amount that the plant sees in most cases. And that's because a portion of the chemical is actually bound to the soil surface and the plant can't get at it. So that's um, how the herbicide partitions between the soil and the soil water um, gives us an indication of how much will be available or you know, seen by the plant. Uh, and that is actually the, the portion that causes or can cause damage to susceptible crops. So what we want to do is we, we want to improve our understanding of how um, chemicals, these herbicides degrade or break down over time uh, in the environment. So can we model that uh, if we know how much we're putting in at, you know, two months after we apply, can we, can we come up with a model that tells us how much will be left in soil two months after it's applied? And that will depend on the weather, in particular how much moisture is there uh, and the temperature and also the soil type. So generally the higher the organic matter content of the soil and the greater the moisture, the more microbial activity there will be. And that's really what drives the breakdown of most, most herbicides. So under dry conditions or cold conditions, uh, the microbial activity is a lot lower and the breakdown will be of those herbicides will be slower. So they will persist for longer in soil. Um, but we can also directly measure those total residues in soil using published methods. So this is some fairly fresh data that we've got from the last season of monitoring at some sites with the Birch of Cropping Group. So I've got one field here where this herbicide, this group B herbicide of Mazamox was applied. And what you can see is that we started off with a low level before application in soil. Um, there was an application and in the topsoil, it's really started to dissipate quite, quite quickly uh, in the first couple of uh, weeks and then slow, slowing down after that. You can also see potentially a little bit of movement here into the subsoil, um, but you can see that that's also dissipating as well. So the breakdown is quite rapid. And so after 180 days, you know, we're left with 10% or even less of what we originally applied. However, at a different site, uh, not too far away, so also within uh, northwestern Victoria, you can see that a similar amount was applied according to the label, but here we have a lot longer um, persistence of that chemical in soil. So after 180 days, from the topsoil, we've only lost, say, 20 to 30%. Uh, and We've had some recent samplings, which will take us up to a year. So it will be interesting to see how they've degraded since then. So we've repeated this at, at a number of different sites. And what you can see here is that indeed, the persistence varies quite dramatically. So in terms of the half-life, um, we've got three sites here where we've got quite a short half-life, which means that it's dissipating from the soil quite rapidly. Um, but we've got two sites here where we've got this uh, longer half-life. 
um, and it will be interesting to, to see whether those residues have carried through to the start of this cropping season. What we want to do now is relate the soil characteristics and the weather characteristics back to see if we can explain why these, uh, this herbicide has persisted for so long at this site. And if we can model that, we can then provide that as a tool to, to growers and consultants where they might be able to put in their application rates and run some scenarios. So if they're expecting a dry year, uh, that they can run some scenarios and see, all right, for my soil type, if I know my organic carbon, if I know my clay content, and I can predict how much rain I might have over the season, how much will I have left in my soil? Or what's our best guess of how much there might be left in the soil at the start of the next cropping season? Uh, and we can, what, um, what that looks like is an example here. Um, so a previous project uh, through the Grains Research and Development Corporation um, developed a model uh, with the uh, collaboration with Gavin McGrath uh, in Western Australia, where we've tried to come up with a model to, to forecast these uh, herbicide concentrations in soil. So here we calibrated this model using data from an earlier paper. This, this was also work funded by the Grains and Research and Development Corporation. Um, and you can see, this is for a chemical called trifluralin. You can see the trifluralin at, was applied at a similar amount at three different sites uh, in the Victorian Mallee area. And you can see that it's dissipating uh, differently at each of those sites. Now, this line here is a, thresh a threshold that I've got from the literature for the growth of oats. So 0.1 microgram per gram is a threshold at which oats um, can suffer damage. So really what we're looking at is can, how long does it take before we've come under that damage threshold? And you can see uh, by November and January at two of the sites, we've come under that threshold. So theoretically, uh, planting oats as a fairly susceptible crop should be okay. So what we did after calibrating that model using the data from Johnson et al, we then used that to see if we could predict what would happen in a fairly dry year. I'm having a, a few issues here. Ah, for 2018, where we only had 270 millimetres of rain uh, in that season. And what you can see here is that we've predicted that for all three sites uh, that there will still be trifluralin residues in the soil um, at the start of the following year. Now the question here is, are those residues actually bioavailable to the plant, um, to the crop plant that we want to sow in the following season? And that's a big unknown. So this, this is a model that, that's been calibrated for this data and what we hope to do with the, with the data from our field sites uh, and our grower groups for, the, for our four priority chemicals is to further calibrate this, this model and validate it to see if we can use it for predict, predicting the persistence of those chemicals in soil. However, knowing the residues in soil is one thing. Uh, and like I said, you can actually send your soil samples. Farmers can go out and sample their soil and send it away to a laboratory, commercial lab for analysis. But what do you do if you, if you get a number where you say, okay, the chemical is there at a concentration of 0.2 micrograms per kilogram. What does that mean in terms of the plant? And surprisingly, there's not actually that much data, uh, quantitative data about how those residues affect crop plants. So another part aspect of our project is to see if we can model and predict from the total residues in soil for a different soil for different soil types how much of the total residues is bioavailable in soil and what will that effect be on plants on crop plants. So we're looking at um, those four different priority herbicides and we're looking at uh, eight different crop species and we're just doing short term. Uh, bioassays in the glasshouse. So three weeks growth, early seedling growth, which sets the stage for how the crop later on uh, develops later in the season uh, and is a critical growth stage. And what you can see here is we've applied clopyrolidin sand. So this is not 
prepare lead in, in a soil, it's in sand, so effectively it, it acts like hydroponics, which means that all the herbicide that we put in the sand uh, is pretty much bioavailable to the crop. So this is a worst case scenario. And what you can see is that even at very low levels, so our label rate of clopyrrolid would be equivalent to about 15 micrograms per kilogram. So even at low levels, even if we've got 90% of that has dissipated in the sand, we're still seeing damage to our lentils here. Uh, and we've repeated this for a number of crops. So here you've got some field peas uh, growing in the sand. And again, you can see uh, damage in terms of the, the shoot dry weight, uh, even at quite low levels. So we've now repeated that in a soil taken from Minipup in South Australia, um, at quite a calcareous uh, high pH sandy soil. Um, but what you can see here is that compared to the previous photo, at the same rates, the field peas are actually doing a lot better. Um, you can start to see some uh, typical curling, um, phytotoxicity damage here, uh, but still similar uh, dry weight accumulation. So we can put this together for all our different crop species, um, for the sand, which is maximum toxicity, and we can compare it to a soil and see, all right, yes, there has been some sorption of those residues, uh, and that's reducing the phytotoxicity to these crop plants. And in this case, by a factor of about 10. So uh, the toxicity threshold here, so this is the, the dose at which we're reducing the crop growth by 20%, um, has increased from 0.5 micrograms per kilogram of chlorpyrrolid in soil to 3.4 micrograms per kilogram of soil. So now we start to get a better understanding. If a farmer does send this soil away for a soil analysis and gets a value back, what those values actually mean. They can start to put that into context and make a decision. So in the case of Minipa, we actually sampled prior to sowing in 2019, after quite a dry 2018. And clopyrrolid was applied at this site uh, in June 2018. And by the time it came round to um, just prior to sowing in 2019, there was 8.5 uh, micrograms per kilogram in the soil. Uh, which would have been toxic, we predict, to lentils and chickpeas, but in this case, Spartacus barley was sown on the 12th of May. And as you can see, um, that's a highly tolerant crop to residues of chlorpyrrolid uh, and was fine. So where do we want to take this? Well, what we would like to do, this is your typical um, plant growth dose response herbicide concentration in soil, and this is our plant growth, so our control growth where there's no herbicide residues present, declining as the residues increase, and we can predict some kind of threshold, so 20% loss of growth, for example. Uh, we can repeat for different soil types, so a sandy soil where our threshold has shifted and our threshold has increased, and again, where we've got a clay soil with higher sorption capacity, or a clay soil with high organic matter where we've got even higher um, sorption capacity. So the threshold has, has crept up. So even if we've got higher residue levels in the clay soil, they might not be all bioavailable. And what we would like to then do is predict if we know our soil sorption coefficient, so if we know our clay content, our, our organic matter content, can we then predict this toxicity threshold? And that's where we'd like to take this current lot of research. So in summary, what this project really is trying to do is come up with, uh, develop better tools for managing herbicide residues in soil. And that's looking at both the exposure of the herbicides in soil and also their toxicity. So developing these toxicity thresholds, which currently there aren't many publicly available uh, and putting that together where we know how much we have in soil, we know what the threshold is, and then the farmer or the consultant can make um, an educated decision based on the probability of the risk on what they should plant or whether they should hold off planting for another month. Um, and then we also have a number of other uh, residue trials in looking at multiple herbicide residues. So 
through this project, we're also looking at the potential um, for the tools we develop here for use in other uh, our projects. For example, if a, if a grower wants to grow a cover crop over summer and is worried about having residues at the end of the cropping season, how might those residues affect the cover crop? Or if a grower wants to grow an intercrop where they're looking at growing two crops together, a, a cereal with a legume in the interrow, uh, how will herbicides affect, affect that crop design? Um, how, does, how does soil management actually affect herbicide persistence? So for example, in Western Australia, um, a number of farmers are now looking at fairly drastically modifying their soil uh, through deep tillage or soil inversion um, and noticing that by burying, by flipping the soil, for example, uh, a lot of the organic matter is, is buried to depth, but it brings up fairly sandy, low organic matter soil into the, into the top of the profile, um, which then means that residual herbicides that are placed in the soil uh, topsoil profile are then a lot more bioavailable to both the crop and the weeds. So they're a lot hotter in terms of their efficacy on weeds, but they also have the greater potential to damage crops as well. So if we can come up with uh, better models for working out how long um, herbicides are persisting in soil for and how bioavailable they are, they can help with decisions regarding soil management uh, strategies. Um, and I think a number of our field sites will then be available to use for, um, as a testing arena for soil health and productivity measures, but also as a decision support tool uh, and a way to transfer that knowledge to, to researchers, to young agronomists and to farmers as well. So I will leave it there and I have probably generated a lot more questions than what I've answered, but that's a snapshot of what we're up to and where we hope to take this research. Um, and I'd just like to thank all the farmers that are collaborating with us, uh, ongoing support from the Soil CRC management team uh, and previous investment from GRDC and New South Wales DPI. And I would be happy to take questions. Thanks very much, Mick. Yeah. Wonderful and um, nicely wrapped up there. So we've got about a bit over 10 minutes left for questions and, and just in the last uh, two or three minutes, a whole lot has come through. So I'll give you a, a look at the time to look at the Q&A box. Can you see that okay, Mick? I can. Yeah, so if you, you know, maybe from the top, uh, read through the questions and uh, attempt to answer them quickly and we'll, be, we'll move through them. So everyone, questions in the Q&A box, not the chat box. Thank you. Okay, so I've got a question here um, from Louise Hunt. Is there any herbicide evident in the plants grown? Uh, so we will be looking at uh, to see if we can detect herbicide residues in, in the plants themselves. Uh, and we have some other projects uh, going on at the moment where we are looking at her measuring herbicide residues in the plants as well. Uh, and that's an additional tool that we'd like to develop through this project. The, the other thing we're looking at is whether or not if the herbicides are dissipating or being degraded within the plant, can we actually look at a, a biochemical injury fingerprint in the plant itself, which may be longer lasting than the herbicide residue itself as a way to diagnose which herbicide uh, it was that caused the, the damage or if it's not caused by the herbicide itself. Um, next question, why doesn't the approval process for residual herbicides include the sort of toxicity trials that, that are being presented here and for a range of repeatable soils, including standard sorption coefficient soils? Um, I, can't, I can't speak directly to the full process that the, the regulators have here, but, but there definitely are a, a number of trials that need to be done before a herbicide is registered. Um, whether or not, I guess the issue is that where do you draw the line? You know, the cost to register a new herbicide um, is quite expensive as it is. Uh, and, I, and I think they have to draw the line somewhere. Um, yeah, so, so I guess, and again, that comes back to what our project's trying to do. It's, it's to better manage these herbicide residues. It's to improve on, on what we know already. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I'll leave it there, but but definitely there's more work that we can do around, around that area. Uh, another question here, Mick, what depth were the soil samples for the virtual cropping group Amazomox? We measured 0 to 10 centimetres uh, and 10 to 30 centimetre uh, depths there. 
um, so the bulk of the residues was in the 0 to 10 centimetres, uh, but, but at one of those sites, we did actually see some residue uh, moving to the, to the lower 10 to 30 centimetre depths. Uh, I have quite a long question here. Um, as you've explained, both soil organic matter and microbial activity influence the rate of herbicide degradation. With increasing soil organic matter, the soil microbial activity generally increases. Uh, on one hand, increasing soil matter increases adsorption uh, to soil, and on the other hand, increasing soil matter increases the microbial activity. Um, so the net effect of organic matter on the residual activity de depends on how much is sorbed and, and the microbial activity. So the question is, what is my view on the effect of soil organic matter, uh, for example, crop residues in no-till farming on herbicide residual activity and toxicity threshold values? Yeah, I think, so that question's from Nancy Bolland. That's exactly what we're trying to tease out here, Nancy, um, is start to put some quantitative values on that. So I think probably most uh, consultants and growers that are involved in, in using herbicides understand uh, qualitatively those aspects of, of managing herbicide residues. But for every different uh, soil type and for every different herbicide, um, the extent to which sorption dominates over uh, the, the increased degradation due to soil microbial activity um, will differ. And that's really what we're trying to do here for these four priority herbicides is say, well, in actual fact, for example, for diuron, it's the sorption that, that drives the toxicity the most. And so if that's bound up and not available to the plants, it's also bound up and not available to the microbes. It may be more persistent, but, it, but it's not as toxic. Um, whereas the flip side might be true for a different chemical. Uh, the next question is, is there any research with mixing fulvic acids with herbicides and how that affects residues in soil? been shown to be a way to reduce the amount of chemicals being applied with many common herbicides. Uh, in, a, in a previous life, I actually did quite a lot of research on fulvic and humic acids, um, looking at using those as, as soil amendments rather than synergists with herbicides. Um, however, the growers that I was working with in Victoria, uh, anecdotally also, some of them were using, it, using fulvic acids as synergists by mixing the, the, the acids with the herbicide at application in order to lower their rates. And they were seeing that um, anecdotally that was improving their, their weed control. Um, I don't think that there's been a huge amount looking at how those fulvic acids might affect the residues in soil. Generally, when the fulvic acids are used as a synergist in that way, they're, they're used at quite low rates. And, uh, and our other research looking at fulvic acids as soil amendments found that the amount applied uh, is such a small amount relative to the organic matter in soil. Uh, so I doubt that the fulvic acids, if, if you're actually mixing them um, prior to applying, would actually have much effect on the persistence of the herbicide residues in soil. <clears throat> uh, a question here is asking for a comment on summer applied herbicides. Um, so yeah, what, I guess a, a couple of those herbicides that I, I mentioned there are priority herbicides. So for example, lapirolid can be used um, for summer fallow weed control. So used in the summer um, when the crop is, is not growing. And again, the, the theoretical considerations are the same um, for the herbicides and the processes we're looking at in soil. I guess what it comes down to there is that those summer applied herbicides, generally you, you, you'll be trying to use herbicides that will break down a lot quicker, that will have less residual activity in the soil if you're then going to be planting a winter crop. Uh, and the key there um, probably comes back to the amount of rain between when you're applying those um, summer fallow herbicides and when you're, you're planting the crop. And so for example, the, the label for 2,4-D really is quite specific on how much rain you should have before, um, before considering the plant back time to, to growing the, the winter crop there. So again, I think that comes back to, in the first instance, really reading and understanding the label 
um, that's, the, that's the key go-to area um, for the first lot of information on, on how to use the herbicides. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think that the tools that we can develop here can be translated to uh, the use of those summer, summer fallow herbicides as well. Uh, another question here, is there industry research about residues uh, from the chemical companies? And if so, how similar or different is it to your outcomes? Yeah, Mick, Louise says you've answered that one, thanks. So we'll move on to the next one. Okay. Um, good question. I am wondering what will be the delivery platform for models that can be developed from, from your work? Um, yeah, currently we haven't got to that stage yet. Uh, we hope to, to bring it to a point where we can put it together as a tool that can, can either be something that can be used online or offline. Um, but yeah, I, I think in the first instance, what this project is really looking to do is to, to validate the models and make sure that we're getting fairly accurate predictions. The last thing we wanna do is to put out tools that, that are actually not giving uh, predictions or estimates that can help growers and, in, uh, and are in fact confounding growers instead. So I think that's something that we'll start to consider towards the end of this project. Um, and, and hopefully we'll get to the point where we can start to deliver those uh, as, as, a, as, a, as a platform online or offline and to be used for quantitative um, predictions. Uh, in notes field cropping systems, do you think soil residues of pre-em herbicides will be different in the inter-row and seeding furrow? Residues may be more on the zero to five compared to the zero to 10 centimetres. Uh, yeah, that's, that's definitely the case, I would say. And that's one of the big challenges with managing herbicide residues in the paddock is that not only are you getting um, movement of the, res of the herbicides down the soil profile, but you also have spatial variation across the field. So not only uh, uh, due to differences in soil type throughout a single paddock, but also the inter-row uh, and the crop row itself. And, and where the herbicide was applied and how it was applied. So for example, many of the pre-emergent herbicides are applied and the soil is then thrown from, from the furrow and ends up in the inter-row. Um, so that's definitely consideration and what that will come down to uh, will, will be the soil sampling strategy. So if we can come up with predictions where we say, yes, if you send us a soil sample, we can measure that and give you an indication of whether or not that will be bioavailable, um, we'll come back to recommendations on where to take those soil samples. And, and that, again, that will vary for chemical to chemical. But it will probably mean that, that in most cases, a farmer won't be sending in one sample, it will be more like five to 10 samples. Uh, and indeed, we know even from the trials we've done now uh, in the previous season, season, that there is quite significant variation across a single paddock. Um, so, and, and, and often that's, that shows up in the crop as well, if there is any toxicity. It might be a lot more patchy rather than an even toxicity across the paddock. Um, the next question, if the assay is measuring plant active residues, should not the thresholds be independent of soil type? Yeah, well that, that's, so there's two, there's two ways of looking at that. So one is if we are measuring the total residue in soil and then estimating uh, the bioavailable residues, um, or if we are directly measuring the bioavailable residues. Um, so we also, there's an aspect of our project that we'll look at developing new methods for actually measuring the bioavailable residues. And yes, that will be independent uh, of soil type if we're just measuring the bioavailable residues. But I think if we're using a model, um, then that will require information on the soil type. Hopefully that makes sense. Nick, it's, uh, it's 11.45 now, but hey, I'm gonna keep it going for another five minutes. This <laughs> Thanks, is going, Michael. You're doing wonderful, so keep, keep going. But no, but audience, please, no more questions. Don't keep typing. We've got to <laughs> a line. thank you. I'll just say as well that I'm more than happy to, to um, discuss further, and it's really beneficial for this project to get this kind of feedback. Um, so feel free to get in contact through the Soil CRC email or give us a call as well if, if we can't get to those questions for the time being. Um, 
Yeah, another question here. Um, what do you think of using pot tests plus and minus activated carbon? This is something I haven't had a lot of experience with. Um, and, and I think definitely a pot, so this question is referring to taking soil from a field that you think that you suspect may have herbicide residues, planting a susceptible crop in, in that soil um, and looking to see how it performs if the same soil that has had activated carbon mixed through it. So the idea there is if you mix activated carbon through the soil, it will bind the herbicide residues and that will give you an example of how the plant should be growing. So that's your control. And then you have your potential herbicide residue um, in soil uh, and you can compare the growth of a plant there against your theoretical control with the activated carbon. I think that's, I think that's, if you don't have anything else to go to, I think that's probably a good thing to do regardless. Um, I guess the question is now we're, we're understanding more and more about activated uh, carbon, um, which I guess can be thought of as similar to biochars and the fact that they can actually uh, promote plant growth through other mechanisms. Um, so what you could be doing there is actually stimulating the growth of of the control plant by putting the activated uh, carbon in there. Um, so yeah, look, I, I probably don't have enough experience looking at many different pop trials to see whether that is the case, but what would be great is if you can then validate those bioassays um, with chemical measurements as well. Uh, so for example, in Alberta and Canada, they used to actually have a service where a grower could send their soil for um, bioassay done at a standard laboratory and that, and that was the method that they were used. That service, has, as, as I understand it, has now been discontinued. Um, uh, and there was a study done looking to see whether how many false positives and false negatives were there. And I think potentially there was a bit too much uncertainty around the measurements um, to continue on. Um, anyway, that's something to think about. Uh, will you recommend a standard residual herbicide test? I don't know that we will, will recommend, at the end of this project, I don't know that we'll recommend a standard residual herbicide test. I guess what we would like to do is, is propose those residual tests. And probably similar to, what, to, to the previous answer, it's almost the more tests, the better. So if we can calibrate chemical measurements and predictions with biological or bioassay measurements, um, you know, having more lines of evidence is, is better than none. So really, I think what we're trying to do is reduce the uncertainty that, that growers have uh, and, and improve their understanding um, rather than get to an eventual end point where, you know, this is the standard and, and this is the be all and end all. Um, we'll see how we go at the end of the, at the project, I guess. Uh, next question here, I presume threshold tests uh, soils are sterile. It would be interesting to see whether soil-borne diseases and nematodes naturally present in soil might change the threshold. Yeah, that's an excellent question. So um, in the first instance, no, the soils aren't sterile. One of the issues with sterilising soil um, is that by doing so, you actually change, can change the properties of the soil. And in many cases, sterilising the soil actually, by killing the microbes, you, you might be releasing the microbe contents and there's a lot more nutrients available and, and you'll be affecting that growth as well. But definitely there is evidence um, for some herbicides that sublethal effects of residues in soil can actually um, shut down some of the defence mechanisms of the crop plants and by doing so then allow predators uh, and pathogens easy access. Um, so you get this compounding effect on, on the plant itself. Um, and, and I guess if a plant is under stress from other abiotic stresses, even for example, frost, uh, those herbicide residues can, can exacerbate those stresses as well. So multiple stresses can, could, can definitely change the thresholds there. I guess what we're saying here is that currently there, there's pretty much no, <laughs> very few thresholds available at all. So really we're trying to, start to come up with some of these thresholds, at least to give an indication. And, and as I said before, I don't think it'll be a, a, a be all and an end all. It'll be more like a probabilistic thing 
that a consultant can take into consideration and say, well, you know, there might be a risk of losing 20% of yield, but considering the weeds that I have or the price of chickpeas in the market, I'm still going to take that risk and I'm still going to plant that crop. Um, so it's just about, you know, taking things to the next level and improving that decision making process. Uh, comment on seeders that throw soil away from the planting row and thus throw contamin contaminated soil away also. Um, yeah, I think, so I guess we've discussed that uh, a little bit just before. And again, that, that will come back to where, if, if, we, if we can use these methods for growers, a lot of the considerations will come down to where the soil samples are taken. Um, I'll probably leave that there for the moment. Um, next question, neurofins have stopped testing for herbicide residues. Are there any labs that you can recommend for both plants and soils? Yeah, I've got a list of labs, um, and I, yeah, I, I don't, I haven't contacted any of them recently, but I can provide a list of uh, labs that I know that are doing residue testing. Um, yeah, and no, no comment on on whether or not um, you know their reliability. I think most of them are accredited through NATA. One of the key questions, if you do send a soil or plant tissue away for analysis is to ask about the limits of detection for their methods. So a number of herbicides are actually active at very low concentrations and that many labs are doing, that are doing high throughput uh, residue testing uh, will not have optimised their methods to find those low levels. So you may get back a result that says less, less than the limit of quantification. That doesn't necessarily mean that the residues aren't still in the soil, it just means that they haven't uh, potentially gone to the, to the to the lower levels that they need to detect them. Uh, in your bioassay, do you water from the top? Yes, in, in the bioassays that we've been using now, we um, work out the water holding capacity of the soil and we try to maintain the water holding, uh, to maintain the moisture content at 60% of field capacity in order to minimise or eliminate effectively. We, we don't have any uh, movement of water out the bottom of the tubes. So yes, there may have been some movement of the residues vertically in the pots, but theoretically there should be no loss of the herbicide out the bottom of the pot. Um, the question here about uh, computational, what computational tools do you use for modeling of persistence? Um, yeah, there are a number of, of published models available. Um, we have recently developed through the previous GRDC project in collaboration with Gavin McGrath um, and other colleagues in Western Australia, um, a predictive model that we have been using and I can send you the uh, link to that paper. Um, but yeah, there are a range of different models available, um, varying from the very intensive parameter um, hungry uh, models that require a lot of inputs um, back down to the other scale of few inputs and I guess probably greater uncertainty. Um, yeah. What are the bases of your model, statistical or based on the physics chemistry of the various processes involved? So the most recent uh, model that I was just talking about there that we, we published last year uh, is both um, mechanistic and stochastic in that we look at the probability uh, distributions of rainfall and soil moisture, um, but use those for mechanistic predictions of degradation and transport in uh, the soil profile. Again, there, there's probably more work to do on that modelling. So we, we, I guess, are trying to come up with models that can be used with a minimum of, amount of input parameters so that they can be used by consultants um, uh, and, and easily used. Um, but, but often that, that does come with a sacrifice of potentially uh, increasing the uncertainty of predictions. Um, 
does an amazomox movement depend on the time between application and incorporating rainfall as well as pH and clay content? Uh, yes, so I, I would believe it, it does. Um, so herbicides, when they first hit the soil, uh, will be in the solution that, that they've been applied on. Uh, that sorption process does take time and that depends on the soil properties and also the chemical in question. So um, the sorption can be, you know, as quick as kind of eight hours. Um, for example, glyphosate readily binds to soil minerals and, and in most soil types is deactivated really quick, relatively quickly through binding. Imazomox is also um, an acidic herbicide, which means that it is is ionized and it's uh, it's negatively charged at higher pH, but at, at low pH it will actually uh, be a neutral molecule. And so it's it's binding and how quick it binds to soil will depend on the soil type, um, and as, and in particular the yeah the, the pH and the clay content um, as well. So in high pH soils, it will be negatively charged and it will therefore repel from negatively charged clay minerals. Um, but at low pH, it will be neutral and will uh, have a greater affinity for soil organic matter at those lower pHs. What about the effect of pH, especially in calcareous soils across the range of herbicides used by growers? Yeah, so that's definitely one of the three, I guess, primary factors that we're looking at when we're trying to predict um, both persistence in soil and also bioavailability, which are, which are interlinked. And again, that depends on the herbicides in question. Uh, and as I, as I just spoke to then, imazomox and clopyrolid are both acid herbicides and the pH will have quite a dramatic effect on how they behave in the soil. Uh, final question, in your pot experiment, did you use commercial product of herbicide or pure chemical? Uh, we, we used co a commercial product in, in our hot trials. And I'll leave it there. Mick, uh, that is a wonderful job of getting through 20 questions in 20 minutes and um, without missing a beat, uh, displaying the the depth of your scientific technical knowledge in this area based on your research. So yeah, well done. Thank you very much for that presentation. And uh, we've got some details there in the chat about how people can follow up with Mick directly uh, via his email. So thank you uh, once again, everyone, for your attendance. I did keep the questions going because uh, we're on quite a roll and there's some really good uh, discussion going on there. I'll remind you of uh, two webinars that we've got scheduled for July. July 14 and July 28, the details are on the screen and there's been links in the chat or you can go to our website to, uh, to get that uh, registration information and or to see the, this webinar, which will be up here in a couple of days time under the publications slash webinars section. We do plan to make this an ongoing um, series. So there'll be webinars in August, September, October, etc. If you have suggestions, you know about the soil CRC work and you, there's a particular project or speaker you want to hear more about or more from, yeah, send us an email, drop us a line and uh, we'll use that to inform our, our future planning. So um, just to, to finish off then, the, um, remind you where our website is, follow us on Twitter, connect with us on, on LinkedIn, subscribe to our YouTube channel, connect with the soil CRC, in this uh, COVID-19 age, there'll be a lot more online delivery of material and uh, I welcome you to engage in whatever way best suits. Thanks again, Mick. Thanks for everyone for your attendance. Thanks, Michael. Bye.